Well, good evening and welcome to the 2021 convention here from Dingwall Free Church. It's a joy that you've been able to join with us for the Scottish Norland Convention online. And we do pray that over the next four evenings that you will be blessed by our time of fellowship together as we praise God and as we hear from His Word. We're excited as to what our speakers are going to be sharing over the next four evenings, and we are really excited to be able to bring convention to you this year, albeit in this way. My name is Robert Adair, and I am a member of the Committee for the Scottish Northern and Convention, and it's my privilege to be able to guide you through the next four evenings. We do pray that God will richly bless our time together. As we begin Convention 2021, can we pray together? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather in your name. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather as Convention, albeit virtually this year, and we do pray that as we gather over the next four evenings, that we will be blessed richly as we hear from your Word, as we fellowship in spirit and in truth. And Father, we just pray that you will be with us as we go through the book of Ruth. Father, we pray that you would speak to us by your word, that you would open your word afresh to us, and that we would learn from your word together. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's great that tonight we are going to have Callum Ian McLeod from Fern Tosh Free Church bring God's Word to us, and it's our privilege to welcome John Wilson as the worship director uh, for the convention this year. John and others are going to be leading us in our worship together, and we're going to start off convention by singing the words of the hymn, By Faith. By faith we see the hand of God In the light of creation's grand design In the lives of those who prove His faithfulness Who walk by faith and not by sight By faith the fathers roam the earth with the power of His promise in their hearts Of a holy city built by God's own hand A place where peace and justice reign We will stand as children of the promise We will fix our eyes on Him, our souls Till the race is finished and the work is done We'll walk by faith and not by sight By faith the prophets saw a day When the longed for Messiah would appear with the power to break the chains of sin and death And rise triumphant from the grave By faith the church was called to go In the power of the Spirit to the lost to deliver captives and to preach good news In every corner of the earth We will stand as children of the promise We will fix our eyes on Him, our souls reward Till the race is finished and the work is done We'll walk by faith and not by sight By 
by faith the mountain shall be moved and the power of the gospel shall prevail for we know in Christ all things are possible for all who call upon his name we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him our souls reward till the race is finished and the work is done we'll walk by faith and not by sight we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him our souls reward till the race is finished and the work is done we'll walk by faith and not by sight We'll walk by faith and not by sight We're uh, going to read God's Word together. Our reading is taken from the Old Testament, the book of Ruth. And the chapter 1, this is God's Word. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons, and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband, even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons. Would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. 
Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Amen, and uh, we trust that the Lord will add His blessing to the reading of His own holy word. Well, as we explore Ruth chapter 1, uh, our key text is verse 16, where Ruth says to Naomi, in no uncertain terms, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God, and so on. A Confession of Faith is our title as uh, we um, engage with this uh, remarkable book and uh, its opening chapter. So, we're going to explore two things, Ruth's choice and Ruth's faith. So, let's begin by looking at Ruth's choice here in Ruth chapter 1. Now, it's been said that every cloud has a silver lining. In other words, every difficult situation that we encounter more often than not has an encouraging or a positive outcome, even though this may not be immediately apparent. Well, such is the book of Ruth. Ruth's story takes place during the turbulent time of the judges, a dark period of spiritual waywardness with widespread idolatry and violence, when, as Judges 17.6 puts it, everyone did as they saw fit. However, even in times of crisis and hopelessness, there are those who emerge as salt and light on the pages of the Old Testament, who stand out and who really do make a difference. Well, such is Ruth. No matter how discouraging circumstances may seem, God can use unlikely characters in His kingdom someone just like Ruth, someone like you and I. Now, we're introduced to Ruth here in chapter 1 during a family crisis. Naomi, uh, Ruth's mother-in-law, as we read, is filled with intense grief and little wonder. She's lost her husband, but to add insult to injury, she's also lost her two sons who were married to Ruth and Orpah. Now, in her sorrow, Naomi decides to leave Moab and return to Bethlehem in the land of Judah. So, what happens then? Well, Ruth and Orpah walk with her at least part of the way until it's time to part once and for all. Now, that parting proves too much to bear. Clearly, they find it difficult to sever their ties and say goodbye. 
and they both appear to want to come with her. But afraid that their desire to follow her is a kind of emotionally charged, heat-of-the-moment, knee-jerk reaction, Naomi urges them to think carefully about their decision. Now, when we come to verse 11, and as we read on, uh, we begin to discover how Ruth and Orpah are both challenged as to whether this is what they really want. The tension then reaches a critical point for them both. Weeping aloud, Orpah makes the first move. She nails her Moabite colors to the mast. She kisses Naomi and bids her farewell and returns to Moab in order to try and build, rebuild her shattered life. But this is all about Ruth, isn't it? So, what about Ruth? Well, Ruth finds herself torn between two situations. We speak of being caught between a rock and a hard place. Well, her sister-in-law, Orpah, has gone back to her people and to her gods. So, what will Ruth do? Well, verse 16, or at least uh, uh, the build-up to verse 16 is, is tense, isn't it? But when we come to verse 14, we read that Ruth, in, in verse, yeah, yes, in, in verse 14, Ruth clung to Naomi. Now, this is a very strong Hebrew word that's used here in Scripture. It means to stick to, to latch on to, like a limpet on a rock. In other words, Ruth refuses to let go of Naomi. Clearly, she doesn't want to. She can't bring herself to let go or turn back. Naomi strongly suggests that she should also follow suit and go back to Moab with Orpah. And then Ruth finds her voice in verse 16, do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from you, Naomi. For where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. By the time Ruth finishes this remarkable response, it's very clear that she has spoken forcefully what was bottled up inside suddenly bursts out as if a pressure valve has just been released. Ruth speaks with conviction and with certainty and with no small measure of confidence. There is no holding back. She speaks her mind, but she speaks doesn't she, from her heart. With earnestness, Ruth nails her colors to the mast, and it's not a Moabite banner that she nails. So, let's analyze Ruth's response. What she's saying effectively is, Naomi, your people, the Lord's people, shall be my people. Naomi, your God, the God of Israel, the only living and true covenant God, the Redeemer of His covenant people, shall be my God. In other words, this is a remarkable confession of faith. So, let's move on now and explore Ruth's faith. Sometimes we try to define what faith is, but sometimes it helps to break it down letter by letter into the following formula. Forsaking all, I trust Him. Because this is precisely what Ruth does. As if to say, I know what this means for a Moabite woman like me. 
leaving my homeland, my world, all I have ever known, severing my ties with the gods and altars and shrines that litter the landscape of Moab, and following the Lord and His people. But this is what I want more than anything else in this life. This much, Ruth is saying, I am sure of. Now, clearly, Naomi is fully persuaded at this juncture of where Ruth's convictions lie, and she stops urging her to go back. So, they begin their journey to Bethlehem. So, how does all of this speak to us? Well, Ruth stands out on the pages of the Bible as an example of one who stood firm and took a brave and courageous stance for her Lord in very difficult circumstances. Her story is told for our encouragement. So, I want to ask several questions. Can you relate to this Moabite woman as you reflect today on your Christian life? how it began, and your pilgrimage along the path of discipleship thus far. Perhaps there was a day in your experience when you too felt torn between this world and the path of Christian discipleship. Perhaps you can recall when the gospel first began to draw you when you sensed the irresistible grace and mercy and peace of God through Jesus Christ? Can you recall when you felt drawn to the Lord Jesus? Can you remember that moment when you said with heartfelt conviction, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow, no turning back. Well, such was Ruth's stance and confession of faith. A parachute jump is often referred to as a leap of faith. I'm told that the most challenging moment is when the parachute instructor urges the parachute jumper to let go and jump. Now, try to picture this scenario. You're 12,000 feet above the ground. Your heart is pounding. Doubt rears its head. There's fear. There's apprehension. There's an element of resistance but you trust your instructor. You have confidence in the integrity of your parachute, and you jump. You take that leap. Well, for Ruth, this was nothing less than a leap of faith. She let go. You know, in order to clarify what faith entails, Charles Haddon Spurgeon would often use the following illustration. Suppose there is a fire on the third floor of a house, and a child is trapped in a room there. A huge, strong man stands on the ground beneath the window, where the child's face appears, and he shouts to the child, "'Jump! Drop into my arms!' It's a part of faith, Spurgeon would say, to know that there is a man there. Still another part of faith to believe him to be a strong man. But the essence of faith, Spurgeon would say, lies in trusting him fully and dropping into his arms. Thus, Spurgeon would conclude, it is with the sinner and Christ. Well, thus it is with Ruth, and thus it was with you when you cried out by faith, 
nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Do you remember that moment, these days when you clung to Calvary's cross, placing your confidence in a Savior who died for you? What is faith in Jesus Christ? The Westminster Shorter Catechism asks. It gives a definitive answer. Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace by which we receive and rest on Him alone for salvation as He is offered to us in the gospel. This sums up, if you like, the symbolic significance of the narrative of Ruth chapter 1. Can you remember again those early days when perhaps you clung to your Bible with the clinging of, of Ruth, when you immersed yourself in the pages of Scripture, clinging to the Christ of Scripture and clinging to the fellowship of God's people? You recall these days when you removed the bushel, the bucket, the container, and fixed your burning lamp of faith in Christ on a lampstand for all to see. Now, perhaps like Ruth, it took courage, it took guts on your part to stand out from the crowd and speak out, because you understood that it would not be without cost implication. It cost you the world, didn't it? Your personal world as it cost Ruth her homeland, Moab, her world. But you understood as well that whilst the entrance fee into the kingdom of God is nothing, the annual subscription is everything. You see, Ruth knew that she was leaving all that was familiar to her behind. She embarks here on a journey that brings her into uncharted waters. But so be it. Moab is no longer the magnet it once was. She's prepared to take that risk because she has confidence in Naomi, yes, but more importantly, she has confidence in Naomi's God and God's people. So take encouragement from Ruth. Perhaps it's been some time since you spoke these words of verse 16 with the conviction of a new convert. Will you not adopt Ruth's discipleship declaration and reaffirm your commitment to Christ, as Simon Peter did when he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Can you say, your people shall be my people, your God shall be my God? Walk along this way with Ruth, if you will. Ruth left all for God. Ruth left all with God. Ruth found all in God, and Ruth yielded all to God. Will you do that? You know, vast crowds would watch the brilliant performance of Blondin, the tightrope artist at Niagara Falls, balancing a rod in his mouth. Blondin would, would push a wheelbarrow across the rope over the falls. On one occasion, seeing among the cheering crowds a small boy, Blondin said to him, Sonny, do you think I could push the barrow back again? 
Yes, sir, was the boy's unhesitating reply. Do you think I could take you across? Blondin asked him. Yes, sir, replied the boy. Good, said Blondin. Jump in and I'll take you. No, sir, was the boy's answer. But as we explore the symbolic significance of Ruth's choice and faith, Ruth said yes. You see, it's been said that faith is deaf to doubts, dumb to discouragements, blind to impossibilities, knows nothing but success. Faith sees the invisible, hears the inaudible, touches the intangible. Into this realm comes faith, and it is at home. And don't these words sum up the theology of Hebrews 11, verse 1, where we read, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. One writer puts it like this, faith is spiritual perception, an insight into the unseen, to sense God at work despite obstacles, and to obey His Word courageously. Well, into this realm enters Ruth, in the opening chapter of this remarkable book. And it's where you entered, is it not, as you first trusted in Christ. It was the reformer John Calvin who once said, through faith confines its view so entirely to Christ that it neither knows nor desires to know anything else. Well, little did Ruth know that in entering Bethlehem, which in Hebrew means the house of bread, that she'd ultimately play her part in the lineage of the bread of life, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The bitter waters of Mara, verse 20, would be transformed into sweet waters of blessing for Naomi and for Ruth. Their felt sense of emptiness as chapter 1 comes to a close would be filled to overflowing with blessing, the Lord's blessing. But doesn't all of this sum up the Christian life for you and I? Blessing upon blessing, grace upon grace in Christ Jesus. The blessing of His Word is more precious than pure gold. The promises of Scripture, all of, all of which are yes and amen in Christ Jesus, are sweeter than honey from the honeycomb itself. But let me finish by addressing those of you who may be on the threshold of Christian discipleship, not far from the kingdom, but perhaps still sitting on the fence. I want to ask if perhaps there is something of Ruth in you, a longing to stand up for the Lord Jesus, a longing to associate yourself with followers of Jesus, but you're holding back. Take encouragement from Ruth. She comes out from behind the shadows of Moab into the open. She no longer hides or conceals her interest and conviction under the, the cover of the darkness of her former world. 
our spiritual interest is no longer a secret by the time we get to verse 16. Instead, it is made known for all to see. It's a wonderful legacy, isn't it? The grace of God has touched the life of this woman, and she no, she's no longer afraid to show it. She breaks ranks and stands up with a confession of faith that can be yours as well. Amen. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Our gracious God, our heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the words that we have been reflecting on, the confession of Ruth. That is the confession of all of your children. We give you thanks for these precious words and we pray that we too would embrace these words by faith and seek to live out our lives as those who are committed without compromise to Christ Jesus our Lord. So be with us and enable us by your grace to walk by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And all we ask is in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We want to thank Callum Ian for his message to us this evening, and we thank him for his preparation and his word to us and that challenge from Ruth chapter 1. As we close our evening together, we're going to sing again and we're going to sing the words of the wonderful hymn, Yet Not I, But Christ in Me.
I do thank you for joining with us this evening on our live streams of Facebook and YouTube. And we do pray that you have enjoyed Convention this evening. If you would like to support the work of the Convention financially, you can do that this year by donating to our Just Giving page. And you can find the information regarding that on our Facebook page and on our website, northernconvention.co.uk. Can we thank you for your generosity uh, to support the work of the Convention this year financially? And we do pray that you will be blessed as you give in the Lord's name. As we conclude our service together, receive now the benediction. And so now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit, rest from me and abide with each one, now and forevermore. Amen. We look forward to welcoming Kenny Ross as our speaker tomorrow evening.